today we are going to look at some of the signs and symptoms that you might be having an underlying condition because sometimes it's usually very easy to ignore them because of their onset. So they usually come in gradually such that it's usually very hard to know exactly what's going on with your body. Until when it's too late, that's when you're discovering, oh, I have diabetes or I have this. Go get a body checkup so that at least in case there's something wrong, it can get to be corrected at early stages. Because you know, when something is diagnosed early, the response to the therapy that you're going to, to get is usually very good. So today we're going to look at those signs and symptoms and I've decided to look for those which are very, very common and usually affect a lot of people. The first one is glaucoma. You see, in your eyes, you usually have a fluid called aqueous humor. Now, this fluid usually gets into the eye and usually drains out and gets replaced. So it's kind of a cycle. Now we have the tubes that usually drain out that fluid and in case they become clogged, um, you are going to have glaucoma. Your chances will be very high. Now, one of the conditions that is usually notorious when it comes to this is diabetes. Now, diabetes is having high blood sugars. In case your body is having a long exposure to uh, sugar, you might affect your veins and the vessels in your body. So they get affected such that those that usually drain the aqueous humor from your eyes, they become clogged. And when that happens, the fluid is still going to build up. The fluid pressure is going to build up in your eyes because there is no outlet. It's only that uh, you're having inlets, so the fluid is coming into your eye, but not draining out. That pressure ends up de destroying the nerves at the back of your eye, causing total blindness, which is not reversible. So when you start experiencing issues with your eyesight, it's good to either, first of all, see an ophthalmologist or see someone or a, or a doctor who will be able to check your body completely to isolate the issue and the cause of your condition. Because in case that was a glaucoma, if left unattended, you might lose your eyesight. Having a yellow skin or the white of the eye becoming yellow is quite common. And this is usually affected by several things. And one which is very dangerous to have is hepatitis. What usually to hepatitis is the destruction of liver cells. Now, the liver cells play a very vital role, not even one role, so many roles. So if you destroy your liver, especially if you have that infection, what you're going to have is some of the things that, you, that your liver does, like for example, detoxification of um, your body and so many other functions, you're going to hamper them. And one of the functions of the liver is breakdown of bilirubin. Now, this bilirubin usually build up in your body because there's nothing that's breaking it down so that it can now be utilized for other purposes like creating bile salts that will help in a um, digestion of lipids. Um, if that happens, then you're going to have a yellowing of the skin and even the white of the eye will become yellowish because of the buildup of that. Now we are not going to look at the conditions that lead to destruction of your red blood cells, like for example, anemia. Let's look at um, the pathological uh, diseases, like the pathogens themselves. The, um, <coughs> you have hepatitis, which is usually caused by a virus, and it leads to destruction of your liver cells. Once you see someone having that issues, then uh, the best thing is to first of all, make sure that they are tested for hepatitis. We have several uh, hepatitis, so, get them tested in case that's the case they might get um, the drugs or if it's a self-limiting type of hepatitis then uh, they might be given just supportive therapy until it resolves another sign is having a white tongue now this might be because of several other reasons but i'm going to narrow down to having candidiasis or candidiasis now oral candidiasis is usually happen when you have overgrowth of um, candida albicans this is a fungal element. If this overgrow, it's going to cause discomfort in your mouth, um, sometimes taking something hot or maybe having some metallic taste in your mouth, all those. And uh, this is because of uh, that uh, fungal element that might be caused by something like uh, maybe you're having immunosuppression. Your immunity is not working correctly so that you will keep the normal flora in your body in check. Candida albicans is a normal flora in the body. But if left untouched, it might overgrow, affecting the functionality of the areas that it's going to grow in. That's a good indication that either you are immunocompromised or you are taking broad spectrum antibiotics that ended up killing 
um, the, the adjacent bacteria. And uh, when you have your normal flora killed, you might have those fungal elements overgrowing to occupy the space that was left by those bacteria. So one, you might be having either uh, a long-term use of um, antibiotics or you're immunocompromised or you're just infected and your immunity is just having a hitch. So you just go get antifungal drugs from your doctor and uh, they're going to clear that. If the issue is being caused by being immunocompromised, narrowing down to the actual cause of being immunocompromised, like for example, you're taking drugs which are reducing your immunity, or maybe you have HIV infection, narrowing down to the exact cause of that situation will uh, help in uh, resolving this issue. Because in case maybe you're having HIV, which is causing you, you being immunocompromised, then uh, treating candidiasis will not make any sense because the same thing will happen right along because you see, after you finish the dose, yes, you're going to manage the candida albicans, but then right along, the same thing will happen again. Another classic sign of having an underlying condition is having opportunistic infections. Now, those infections will not occur in an immunocompetent individual. Let's take, for example, like a Kaposi sarcoma. It might not affect a normal individual until you are immunocompromised. Kaposi sarcoma is caused by a virus called HSV, and in case you have that infection in your body or in your skin, it means that you're immunocompromised, and narrowing down to the actual cause will help in resolving that condition. Swollen feet is another classic sign, and it might be caused by several things. It may be caused by the heart failure, it may be caused by the um, liver failure, kidney failure, clots, something like uh, the veins themselves, and we're going to start with the heart. In case you're having a failure in the left hand side of the heart, uh, this might lead to accumulation of the salts in the, in the legs, and this might lead to now retention of fluid, or the, the blood, the fluids that come from the blood in the lower extremities. Now this is going to lead to now that accumulation of fluid, we call this edema. And also if you are having a low blood pressure, it means that your heart is not beating hard enough and the pressure that's being generated there is not enough to push the blood all the way around the body. So you might find that it's getting hard to pump blood all the way through to the legs and back to the heart. When it comes to the kidney, kidney is very essential when it comes to now controlling the amount of fluids in the body by balancing the electrolytes. In case that fails, it's very easy for fluid to accumulate anywhere in the body and especially the lower extremities because also blood is being affected by gravity. Now when it comes to liver failure, liver uh, contributes to the manufacture of something we call albumin. This is a protein that is in the blood that helps in keeping fluid within the blood and not letting it leak outside the vessels. So yeah, it's usually leak here, yeah, but the normal amount. When you have enough albumin, it will make sure that the blood is not giving out a lot of interstitial fluids. In case you have less of that albumin, it means that uh, the capacity of the blood to maintain the, the, the water, let's, let's just call it water, within itself, uh, it's going to be low, meaning that it will be very easy for that water to leak outside the blood vessels, creating a condition like a swollen feet. When it comes to the veins, there's something we call venous insufficiencies, whereby you find that the, um, the vessels that carry blood back to, let's say, from the leg all the way back to the heart, either they are vasodilated, meaning that the, the lumen is big. So this is going to reduce the pressure of the blood going back to the heart, meaning that uh, that blood is going to be retained more on the lower extremities because the pressure is low. Also within those veins, we usually have things that we call valves. Valves usually make sure that the blood is not flowing back, it's only flowing in one direction. If you have those valves being damaged or being weak, not being able to retain the blood uh, flowing in one direction, you might find that blood is finding it hard to go upward. Finally, you might be having a clot. Now, clots are usually very dangerous, and when they are in the, the lower extremities, they act like a traffic jam, or maybe there was an accident somewhere, and uh, every other car behind it will have to either go slowly so that they'll be able to pass the area where we have that issue, or the traffic will just stop completely. Now, this is the case that will happen to the blood vessel. Case maybe that cloud lodges somewhere, and the blood is not able to penetrate through, 
blood will build behind that clot and uh, eventually this will lead to accumulation of that blood in any part of the body and uh, if it's in the leg you're going to get that blood just accumulating there and unless that clot is removed you're going to find it very hard to now bring the leg back to the normal condition. Another sign is having bad breath which is chronic meaning that even if you wash your mouth that, uh, that odor, that bad breath is not going to go away. Meaning either you're having gum diseases or you're having what we call tonsil stones. They're very notorious because they will hide in there because you have those stones and they have bacteria and the bacteria activity will create uh, production of gases like uh, compounds of sulfur uh, meaning that you're going to have that bad breath regardless of whether you wash your mouth or not. Now to fix this, first of all, make sure that you go see a dentist to see whether you're having issues with your gum or you have um, the tonsil stones. If you have them, then they should be removed. If you're having gum diseases, be treating that will resolve that bad breath. Another sign is uh, sudden weight loss, coughs, a cough that's not going away, and um, sweating, which is very intense, especially at night. Now, this is a classic sign that you're having TB, and TB can be very dangerous. And the fact that it's airborne, so you can transmit this to your family members or even um, your friends, it makes it very dangerous. So if you have TB, make sure you seek attention as soon as possible or if you have any of those symptoms. Now, TB might be very sensitive so when it comes to treatment because you see, if you fail the drugs or you take the drugs of the way but TB does not go away, you might be having a TB that we call, especially those pulmonic, you might be having a TB that we call uh, MDR. MDR TB is multi-drug resistant TB, which is very stubborn. You're going to take drugs for two years without fail and if you fail then you start again from scratch and um, this is not a good thing to have so in case you're having coughs you yeah, may be sweating so much at night you have a very unexplained weight loss this may be a sign for you to rush to the nearest hospital excessive sweating oily skins and having obstruction in the body maybe in the gut or in the pulmonary uh, lumens this might be an indication of having cystic fibrosis. Now, this is a defect. Mostly, you might get this through inheritance. You might find that in a certain family, it's being passed down the lineage. This is a very stubborn condition, and uh, mostly it usually requires a lifelong treatment, and especially if this is genetical. Now, you're going to find that um, sometimes you're passing out stool that's oily. Obstructions in the body caused by cystic fibrosis might lead to other conditions, like for example, uh, let's say your pancreatic duct is uh, blocked. When that is blocked, what will happen is that the pancreatic juices will not get to the gut for digestion of the food. So you're going to have impaired uh, digestion of foods. Meaning, uh, like lipids are not going to be digested as well and you're going to pass that in your stool. And one of the tests that is usually uh, used to diagnose this condition is called pilocarpine iontophoresis. It's a very interesting one and uh, in case you have any of those you can just go for diagnosis another sign that you're having a condition is uh, having weak bones which are easily broken so getting several fractures might be an indication that either you have osteoporosis or something to do with calcium if you're not getting enough calcium or the calcium that you're getting in the body is not um, getting to the right places you might end up having issues with your bones even phosphorus. Phosphorus will also help uh, in the buildup of your bones. In case that's the case, you're either having a deficiency of calcium or phosphorus. And uh, this might affect how well your body bones are being built. Another classic sign is scratching your perianal area, meaning that you're scratching your anus uh, around the anus. Now, this might be an indication that uh, you have an infection or an infestation by a parasite that we call Enterobius vermicularis. This is pinworm. When this happens, when you have that infection, the adult stages of this worm will, uh, when you're sleeping, will come out, lay some eggs around the perianal area, and uh, when they react with oxygen, uh, they're going to produce something that will irritate your skin and when this happens you're going to scratch yourself and when you scratch and dislodge um, those eggs 
uh, this will be a mode of their dispersal. So if you, for example, take food without washing your hands, then you're going to reinfect yourself or maybe if you handle other people and uh, they don't wash themselves when they are taking food or maybe if you handle their food and they eat that, then you're going to spread the same infection to them. So that's how they influence you into spreading their eggs. Now this diagnosis is done by either taking stool and looking for the eggs of that parasite or just looking for the actual parasite or using a scotch tape whereby you find that a tape is just placed uh, around the anal area and then that tape is taken to a microscope to observe whether there is any egg that's there.